software directly, but then you wouldn't get the support, automatic upgrades, testing, and so on. And for a mainstream customer, that feels like a risky situation to be in. <coughs> That's how an open source company is supposed to work in an ideal situation. But it's not like the old proprietary model is fading away. Microsoft is a $223 billion company. Oracle is a $103 billion company. SAP, kind of SAP is a $58 billion company. The biggest, most successful open source vendor, Red Hat, is a $5 billion company. So maybe I should be worried. I should be polishing my resume. Both open source and open source companies still, they sound like fucking helpless bunnies. They're cuddly and fun to play with, but way overmatched in marketplace. Why am I so confident? I'm confident because there's more to this story than just the market for straight draft software. <laughs> there's a lot more to the fluffy bunny than meets the eye. The fluffy bunny is busy transforming the field of <laughs> in profound ways and leaving carnage in its wake. For, for example, the Economist magazine, arbiter of the free market orthodoxy, has already taken in the situation and declared open source a serious player. Open source has won the argument. It is generally accepted that the future will involve a blend of both proprietary and open source software. How can this be? The leading open source company is a market capitalization of less than 3% of the leading proprietary company. How can open source win the argument when it's so manifestly overmatched? Here's how. First, you can't understand the success of open source exclusively by looking at the marketplace. In the marketplace, the unit of competition is a company, and the measure of success is profit. The more dollars you take in, the more successful you are. If you take in too few dollars, you go extinct. That might sound familiar. A lot of people have noticed there are parallels between the market and the field of evolutionary biology. Taking an extreme, you get theories like social Darwinism, but for our case, the metaphor is instructive. If only the strong survive, those companies, organisms, that best adapt to their markets, environments, that can take in the most food, money, and take in the most food, and those that do not, go extinct, they go bankrupt. Also, as with evolutionary biology, it's easy to be distracted by the big lumbering beasts that appear to be engaged in competition. And directly engaged in competition, evolutionarily important competition, and that's a bad thing, because the really important competition is not at the level of the organism, but at a lower level, much farther down, in the realm of the gene. And this is the competition between genes described by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, which is an exploration of how simple, selfish reproductive, reproductive behavior at the level of genes can lead to apparently altruistic behaviors at the level of the organism. The Dawkins formulation, behaviors that maximize the chances of genetic survival are passed to future generations, even when those behaviors endanger the survival of a particular organism as a whole. For example, here's a behavior that makes no sense in an organism-centric model of evolution. This is a uh, killdeer on Vancouver Island where I live, engaging in a distraction display. And the parent bird puts on a really elaborate and totally false display of being injured to draw an approaching predator, or in this case, guy with a video camera, away from its young. Now, the parent organization, organism is placing itself at great risk here. Why? Because the strategy is not about self-preservation, it's about preserving the genetic heritage of the children in the nest. Now, the self gene came out in 1976, and, his and in his opening pages, Dawkins had this to say about some of his contemporaries, and you can see right away where he gets his reputation as a gentle and self-effacing man. The problem with these other books is their authors get it totally and utterly wrong. <laughs> they get it wrong because they misunderstand how evolution works. They made the erroneous assumption that the important thing in evolution is the good of the species or the group rather than the good of the individual or the gene. And the same criticism applies to people who attempt to understand the success of open source through a simple analysis of the marketplace. They misunderstand how software lives and dies. Confusing the host with what it carries. Because the unit of competition in the world of software is not the corporation, it is the program. It's the software, it's the source code. In the biosphere, organisms feed on other organisms. 
which feed on plants, which feed on the light from Mr. Sun. So in the end, the competition is for sources of energy, either direct in the form of sunlight or stored in the bodies of animals and other plants and other animals. In the cyber sphere, programs also compete for resources. The resource that programs compete for is developer time, commonly known as human attention. So programs feed on developers, who in turn feed on caffeinated beverages and try to stay away from Mr. Sun. <laughs> programs need programmer attention to survive. A program that is no longer being maintained and updated is a program that is dying. A program that no one has a use for is dead. First it will be abandoned, unrun, then it will become unrunnable, and then it will be deleted. Programs need programmer attention to survive. When Oracle gobbles up yet another enterprise software company, do the customers bemoan the death of the company? Oh, B, it's gone. No, primarily they worry about the software. Will the bugs be fixed? Will we get that next release and full of new features? Will the developers quit and flee to greener pastures? Will the owner continue to feed the software? And what does the software worry about? All that matters to the software is that it continues to receive a steady supply of development. Understanding the competition between proprietary and open source as a competition at the program, the software level, clears away a lot of distractions, because now we can directly evaluate which strategy is the most adaptable strategy for survival. Is it the open source model or the proprietary model? A proprietary program can be best understood as a form of parasite. <laughs> it resides in symbiosis with the host organism, the corporation that owns it, and draws its sustenance exclusively from the developers provided by the corporation. The amount of sustenance provided to the program pretty directly correlates with the success of the corporation selling the program, though sales success may or may not correlate with the quality of the program. And when the corporation dies, the program usually dies too. If the corporation is subsumed by another corporation, the new host may continue to feed the program, starve it to death, or terminate it immediately in favor of some other program. When you think about it that way, it's easy to be a little bit sorry for the poor proprietary program. It's very much at the mercy of its host. The success and failure have nothing to do with its, may have nothing to do with its intrinsic quality, and it may only have a small team of developers to love it, feed it, and carry its memory for it if it should die. In contrast to the sheltered monastic life of proprietary software, the lifestyle of successful open source program is incredibly promiscuous. Any developer with a nice smile and a good patch is welcome to join the party. Open source programs can draw sustenance in the form of long-term stable commitments from corporations who sell services or products around the software, or from devoted contractors who derive <laughs> income from contractors <laughs> from or from quick relationships with casual developers who just drop off a patch and run away. In contrast, proprietary programs are embedded within the institutional framework of a corporation. So it's much harder for them to form relationships with new sources of development. People can't just stroll in the door and add a new feature to Microsoft Word. The relationship between developer and proprietary software is formal, contractual, and exclusive. Open source programs can form relationships with multiple developers, multiple organizations, simultaneously, because open source is not trapped inside a single organization.